Uh, welcome back and good afternoon. We now turn to a series of considerations, uh, beginning um, with a, a synthetic uh, overview of where we are and, more importantly, where do we need to be moving forward. Um, and um, our dear colleague, um, Stefania Giannini, will lead the presentation, Education, a More Resilient, Inclusive, and Human-Centered Recovery. Stefania. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Once again, it's a great honor, great pleasure to be part of this tradition at the Pontifical Academy, gathering expertise, uh, outstanding scholars to share knowledge, experiences, especially now, especially this year, and uh, especially this week, uh, we meet at the time where we are witnessing uh, escalating military attacks in Europe, at the heart of Europe. You know, I belong to a generation who thought that this was not possible, actually. And we see, uh, you know, accounts of human suffering among civilians potentially changing the course of history. So this strikes as we struggle to emerge from another big challenge, the global health crisis that has been already very much discussed uh, in depth this morning and this afternoon. And uh, the interventions uh, we heard since this morning all ring the alarm on the devastating consequences of this pandemic on children and youth. We can say, to put it simply, it's a kind of deep human recession with social, academic, and economic toll. Six months ago, maybe you remember, um, no, sorry, six months into the pandemic, to one year and a half ago, the UN Secretary General had warned of a generational catastrophe. And this is a kind of language uh, which has stayed in our vocabulary all over these months. And coming from the perspective of the UN agency charged with education at all levels, I wish today to share a few further insights into lessons emerging from this pandemic and why, especially why, there are a clarion call for transformation. So, some bad news and some good news, at least from my personal understanding and experience over the last uh, two years. Let's start with some data evidence. Uh, I, you know, we heard already very much this morning, but let me recall that today, two years into the pandemic, exactly this week, schools have reopened in a majority of countries after closures that range from a world average of 20 weeks to more than a full school year in many Latin American countries, for instance, and beyond that, in some cases, let me quote Uganda, where schools were shut for 80 weeks. School reopenings don't equate with the end of the crisis. It would be dangerous to consider that back to school is back to normal or back to better. Over 400 million students in some 40 countries are still learning in hybrid mode, demanding adjustments in teaching or learning. And I think the scars of this experience uh, somehow run deep, as many already mentioned. Let me recall some figures which can tell us the scale. UNESCO estimates that 24 million children may never make it back to school, swelling out of school numbers. Poverty, child labor, early marriage, unintended teenage pregnancy are all factors striking the right to education. It was already before the crisis. A joint report with UNICEF and the World Bank, I already mentioned before, the this, this strong permanent interagency cooperation as one of the positive outcomes of this crisis, well, this joint report estimates that the number of 10-year-olds in low- and middle-income countries 
were unable to read and understand a simple story, very simple test, could reach up to 70% from the already dramatic 53%. That means plus 100 million in addition to the 480 million of learning poverty in, uh, in the world. This same report estimates that the pandemic could cost this generation of students, the COVID-19 generation, I we call in the title of this workshop, close to 70 trillion in lifetime earnings. Well, having said that, we are not paying the price of inaction over this period, but of a pre-existing crisis that has actually collided with the global pandemic, laying bare deep old lines in how education is managed and conducted. I think some presentations, including Jeffrey Sachs' presentation this morning, clearly made the point of that. At standing pace, governments everywhere reacted, reacted uh, promptly, um, overnight, nearly to pivot the entire education system to a distance learning, to new online platforms, or a mix of low, high tech solutions from radio, television, and what we call today hybrid models. To put it simply, this innovation and agility has been essential to ensure continuity of learning. I already mentioned before the importance of ensuring continuity of learning, and we have to estimate the cost of not having done that. But it would be somehow disingenuous to say that technology saved the day and holds a golden key to universalize access and bring home better report cards. Later this month, as already mentioned, we'll be publishing a report, the title provocatively says, an ad tech tragedy with question mark, and we actually hesitated to end it on a question mark, but there are some reasons why, I will explain briefly. This is not a treatise against that tech, but a warning about the over-reliance on technology for learning and the uncritical acceptance that digital transformation of, of education is the desirable, inevitable, and the pillar of educational resilience. Overwhelming evidence goes against the oft-heard mantra that technology will enable education to leapfrog to a better future. If you take it like it is without trying to drive based on ethical principles and a true transformation. First, for nearly 500 million learners, it was a solution that never started for millions more, one that quickly broke down. Half of the world population lack a functional internet connection. This is something we know clearly. Over 700 million people don't have access to electricity. In many low-income countries, less than 10% of children and adolescents are connected against 90 percentage in high-income ones. And the cost of devices, even the cheapest available smartphone, it's simply prohibitive for poor families. So digital divide is one of the obstacles that we have to address effectively with a very coherent and comprehensive approach. We also saw digital inequalities play out everywhere, including gender digital divide, including in the world's most advantaged countries. Beyond the hardware dimension, let me recall some other important variables uh, further prevented a tech for, from being a ready-to-go solution. Teachers' readiness to use technology, only half of middle-income countries offer training on digital skills for teachers. Available space to learn at home, the ability of families uh, to support their children learning, and of course, economic pressure. So this is why school closures come with a kind of cascading effect that supercharge inequalities. And this was far more than deprivation of education. Globally, let me mention another, another aspect, another dimension 
and uh, uh, some numbers which can enlighten how uh, it's a complex issue to address. Globally, about 370 million children missed out on school meals and essential health services. Our service found that in many low and middle income countries, girls shouldered an even greater burden of domestic responsibilities, while boys' participation in learning was often limited by the need to earn an income. And prolonged isolation, fear loss, and many other factors that you are absolutely already very well developed today have brought issues of mental health to the forefront. So various studies from the US, the UK, and the OECD report increases in depression, anxiety, mental health, emergencies, and suspected suicide attempts. And although global data is limited, evidence shows that cyberbullying has been on the rise, with girls between the age of 11 and 13 increasingly at risk of being targeted by online sexual predators. But this is something that from uh, Professor Kaffo's presentation we learn. So in short, the COVID-19 generation, what is about, how we can define? I think the COVID-19 generation has been uh, a generation that could see inequalities and poverty increase and could see a lot of uh, different uh, dimensions uh, and challenges that they are facing today growing up with this sense of anxiety and uncertainty. Climate change, digital transformation, uh, an increase in intolerance, uh, and uh, more recently, some other important global geopolitical tension, so to say. But now, let me move to the, to the positive side. What are the implications of of all these and uh, how and what has to be put in march for this generation to recover and thrive. I think it's part of our duty and our common agenda. Education, uh, this is very much a UNESCO perspective, is a basic fundamental human right and the strongest driver anchored to shape a sustainable future. I think we all agree in this room uh, about this point. The urgency now of the learning recovery has to be tackled through a much bolder and braver rethinking of education, of its purposes, its contents, and delivery models. In other words, its role as a public common good. And I think we don't have to, to lose this opportunity. Times of crisis call for visions for sure, for acts of fate, just like those that founded the UN in the aftermath of the Second War. At the several turning points in recent history, uh, UNESCO has spearheaded an exercise to set out a new vision for its domains of competencies, including education. Professor Ryman's very much well presented one of these milestones that has been released recently and interestingly has been planned before the COVID-19 pandemic, exactly a few months before the world changed into 20. And uh, I don't have to spend too much time on that as uh, Fernando already explained the sense and the spirit of this uh, report. I just brought some uh, also summaries to, to, for your attention, but the real core key message is calling for a new social contract for education, uh, which is about rebalancing a lot of different system of relationship with each other, with the planet, and with technology, of course. It makes the case for pedagogies that emphasize cooperation and solidarity. So it's about, of course, using the, the language uh, in a different way. It's not more about competition in education or through education, but it's about cooperation through education and solidarity. And for curricula and prize, ecological, intercultural, and interdisciplinary through interdisciplinary learning. 
In a world that remains deeply interdependent, despite escalating tensions, we more than ever need education to build personal and collective capacities for transformation. I don't think it's an utopia, honestly. It provides a direction to guide what I already mentioned this morning, a human-centered recovery, and it's possible to get it. I think that uh, to have a transformation in, in education and transformation in society through transforming education, uh, there is a, a kind of uh, dynamic process of interaction with the world to put in practice. And uh, I see a few gold standards to make this happen. Let me recall briefly, as time is going run. As the pandemic has demonstrated everywhere, schools are far more than places for learning, spaces for growing together, social interaction, protection, nutrition, essential services. I, I already evoked the academic and psychological toll of closures. The first step is about inclusive recovery to get all kids back to school and learn in safe environments. This is a priority that we share as international community. This is a priority that we want to present at political leadership to focus and to invest about. Every school needs the capacity to assess learning losses and put in place remedial programs whether through target instruction, consolidating the curriculum, or extending instructional time. But a real successful recovery has to go beyond the academic, especially for the most vulnerable children, acting on all the barriers that keep still them out of school or not learning. Comprehensive school health and nutrition programs, including school feeding, are essential. To, to get this uh, achievement. This is why UNESCO is working with some partners on that side, such as UNICEF, the World Food Program, WHO, and uh, there is an interesting initiative now, which we call the School Meals Coalition, which is supposed to provide this approach, comprehensive approach to school organization and uh, policies in the coming, year, in the coming months. Second point, teachers and teaching profession. We didn't talk so much today about teachers. You have to keep in mind that without teachers well motivated, well trained in the center of the classroom, nothing happens. And teachers carry tremendous responsibility. They are already at the center stage of this recovery and they've been our frontline workers like medical hospital, uh, medical doctors at the hospital during the pandemic. And this brings me to, so we need to, to really to invest, to recognize, to support uh, the social role of teachers and to put in practice policies which are uh, exactly coherent with this vision. And this brings me to the third point, which is about how we steer the digital transformation for inclusion and equity. This is a point which you already mentioned this morning, many speakers. and. Uh, we know that we are not on the right track. Our education tech tragedy studies uh, cautions that the logic and business models steering this transformation, led largely by commercial technology, of course, uh, tend to track education and knowledge as private commodities. But there is the, the duty to, to reverse this vision and to unlock the potential of technology at the service of learners and teachers and communities. This is the, the, the sense of the initiative that we gather together with Dubai Cares, a partner which is very much focusing on connectivity. And the result is the Global Declaration on Connectivity for Education that puts forward three key simple principles. Center innovation on the most marginalized, expanding investing in open, free, and high quality digital content, and supporting pedagogical innovation through technology. And this kind of provides a roadmap to develop in the coming months. Well, which is the challenge now? I think our challenge today is uh, humanistic and ethical. 
these are the two dimensions which are still a bit missing in the big picture. We have a collective responsibility towards this COVID-19 generation to make education a public good and involve youth in protecting, defending, creating, and co-creating the new model. The United Nations Secretary General, as you may be know, has called for a transforming education summit, which is not to be supposed to stand in a lone event at the end of this year in September alongside the General Assembly, but it should be really a kind of a catalyst of a catalyzer of a movement around education. And this will take a surge, we hope, in financing. And uh, I just to recall some numbers, education's share of total public spending has remained stagnant over the past 20 years, but this is something that Jeff already very clearly mentioned and recall all of us, and the funding deficit could hit $200 billion a year. So the small money we are, you know, we are, we are mobilizing are really peanuts uh, in, uh, in comparison to what we need. And this is the urgency to boost education's share in recovery plans, which is not the case, actually. Well, we also learned that education is not a standalone goal. It's a societal endeavor, and it needs all society behind it. Children and youth themselves living in most deprived circumstances contest uh, in conflict affected situations like refugees, like migrants, are asking for this human right. And this is their hope and future. I think that this is why, one, the reason why the global compact launched by Pope Francis two years ago carries such meaning to us at UNESCO. And that's why we are so committed to, to give our contribution to that that important mission. Still, I wish to go back to square number one, as I mentioned before, which is about the importance of language, language matters, and it's about building a new narrative now, keeping back those key words that two years ago, a few days before the word changed, were already in our common vocabulary in this room. Solidarity, respect, tolerance, making education the main driver for that. And this is something that His Holiness affirmed at the interreligious dialogue last October at the Vatican when I had the privilege to, to, to be invited to attend. And he also gave to us at UNESCO a, a, a nice message to teachers, valorizing the role of teachers in the process. Quoting from the Pope, all change requires an educational process aimed at developing new solidarity and a more welcoming society. And I think that this is uh, the new grammar and the new vocabulary we need for the coming years. And I think we have a legacy to build on, and that's, I mean, also the sense of this initiative. Thank you very much.